Good morning and welcome to the second meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure that mobile phones are off or on silent uh, while uh, it's acceptable to use social, uh, mobile devices for social media. Please don't take photographs or record proceedings uh, as the, we do that as the Parliament. Uh, we've had apologies this morning from two members of the committee, David Stewart and Sandra White. The first item on the agenda is an evidence session with Sport Scotland and can I welcome to the committee uh, Stuart Harris, the Chief Executive, uh, Jacqueline Lynn, uh, Sports Development Head, School and Community and John Lunn, uh, Sports Development Head, Pathways at Sport Scotland. Welcome and thank you for your attendance this morning. Can I start by simply asking you um, uh, to reflect, I know you will be looking ahead to the next year, but to reflect on the last year and on the ways in which you have measured the impacts of your work and uh, uh, ask you in general terms uh, how far you're satisfied that the way you measure impact is giving you what you need in terms of uh, achieving uh, eventual outcomes. Okay, thank you, Convener, and thank you for the opportunity to, to have a conversation with the, with the committee. Um, over the, the, the last, we're just coming at the end of a, a, a planning cycle, which uh, finished. We tend to use the Commonwealth Games as just a touch point. It's not the priority, it's just a touch point, but it allows us to review everything we do. Um, we have, for the last six years, been very clear about the way in which we want to work, trying to create a system approach for sport and physical activity across the country. The essence of that is that schools, clubs, communities, performance, all connected driven by fantastic people, the bulk of whom are volunteers, and great partnerships. And, and I'm probably going to talk quite a bit, convener, about partnerships across this session, because in order to get effective results, efficient results with the resources that we all have collectively across the country, I think it's really important that we work together to make the most of those. With the common outcome is we want to see people of all ages taking part in sport for whatever reason they want to take part. So in all of those areas, we think there's been some really strong performances in schools and education. Active schools now in its 14th year. Um, this is something that we at Sports Scotland feel really strongly about, this commitment to long-term outcomes, um, young people being at the heart of that, and making sure that our partnership with local authorities with the education sector, are reaching to every single school in the country, all two and a half thousand, gives us an opportunity to introduce young people to activity for life and sport. And for those who want to go to that other, other end, which is performance, if they have the talent, ability, ambition, then they could do that also. In the community world, we, uh, at the back, after the Commonwealth Games in 2014, we established a uh, of just over 100 community sport hubs. Uh, and again, you'll recognize the theme from this is that we are really keen to put sport at the heart of communities across the country. So we now have 196 community sport hubs. Over 50% of those are in schools. There are a huge number of clubs and people participating in those. These are self-determining, self-managing, and it's something we think will continue uh, to grow and develop. Uh, and I'm on record previously as having said that every secondary school in Scotland should be a community sport hub and perhaps some of the primary schools as well that have the facilities to do so. In performance, we came through the Commonwealth Games, 44 medals, fantastic result in Gold Coast. And underpinning all of that activity um, for us is the clear articulation of all of our individual work and partnership work in sport and physical activity has with the Active Scotland Outcomes Framework. Um, we are very, very clear that the Active Scotland Out Outcomes Framework offers Scotland a fantastic opportunity to make the nation active. If sport, education, health, transport, environment can all work together to offer opportunities for people to be active, whether it's just going for a walk or playing sport with their friends at whatever age uh, they are. In, t in terms of measurement, on an annual basis, we produce, and I think you may have been given a copy of that, the Active Scotland Outcomes Framework, from our perspective, what our contribution was. But if 
from our from also from our perspective, it's really important that all of the areas that I mentioned earlier on are able to articulate their individual contribution, but also the partnership contributions that they had. So we would talk about active schools and our partnership with education. And the results are not just ours, they're those in partnership with education. In each of the areas that we, that we work with um, on active schools, we have data for every single school, very clear articulated data, which is specific to each school, primary or secondary, which allows us to review and reflect on where we are with partners to therefore plan better to go ahead and try and improve the opportunities for more activity. And, and in terms of that framework you've described, is that something that you review on a regular basis? Do you keep it under review? Uh, does it change from year to year? What's the process, if yep. you like, for ensuring you're measuring the right things? And so at the moment, uh, Kavina, we're spending a, we're at the end of that four year period. So we're taking a look at everything we do. We're reflecting on what has impact, what's, the, what's giving us the best value for money, what's the most effective partnership tools that we have. Um, we don't have a huge number of, of activities that we work, work with. We've tended to work and invest in people. So an example of that would be we've got over a thousand positions, full-time positions in active schools, community sport, that we work with partners to support and develop. And these are extended commitments for, for a number of years. On an annual basis, we drop down into community sport hubs and look at the data, and each of the the communities around those hubs, the officers that are supporting them, will review how they've got on, what the results are, how they can then target uh, additional participation, albeit they have to look at the capacity for that in terms of uh, facilities and uh, people. Um, and for us, uh, convener, it's really important that we continue to review on an annual basis and on an ongoing basis everything we do. At the end of a cycle, we've got a four-year period, we can look at that extended period. But the critical thing is we look at how each of those sectors connects. So how is school connecting with the community and how does all of that connect up with performance? Thank you very much. Alec Colhampton. You can be in a good morning to the panel. Um, I'd like to start by asking how we calibrate both investment and focus in, in sport in respect of uh, promoting elite performance and wider access ground level um, involvement because um, you know we've talked a lot and uh, rightly so about Scotland's plaudits around elite uh, performance but I'd like to say how do you you know what's the focus of your organization's time between elite performance versus wider access uh, grassroots involvement okay so I'm going to answer this in a couple of ways one we try to look at this from a perspective of Scotland um, so you probably heard me say this before of, of the public investment 90% is, is spent on grassroots and community uh, support. Um, in terms of high performance, um, we spent last year about 18% of our budget on, on performance sport. It's, it's a very tight area. There are 640 athletes supported at the moment, uh, and their ambition is to win medals very clearly uh, at, at major games on that world stage. And there is a connection to UK, so we try and make sure that that connection into UK, which has got brings resources with it, UK resources, we want to access that as well. So the calibration's always been, uh, if I just use that percentage, um, it's 90% on activity around schools and communities, people and places, and about 10% on performance sport. Could you just explore that interface between um, Scottish sport and wider UK Team GB, as it were? Um, how, how does that operate on a sort of day-to-day -day basis? And um, is there, do, do we get funds from UK athletics and UK other sporting disciplines? Or could you yeah. outline that? First, so please? just a, a, a potted history of that. So UK sport will fund the British bodies. So let me just use an example. It's right in my front of my head from last week, boxing. Um, so the expectation, our expectation, doesn't quite meet UK sports yet. But we think there needs to be a greater alignment between the resources spent at a UK level in supporting a British body and what the reach and impact into a Scottish body would be. So the resources will be given to the British body and it's our job to make sure there's an alignment and a pathway with Boxing Scotland to make sure athletes have got the best opportunity to step into what's 
called a world-class athlete program. So there's a podium program and a podium development program. Uh, and in all of the sports in Olympic or Paralympic disciplines, we try and make sure that that's the outcome for us. We could then hand those over to the British body, which are supported by significant resources. In the last cycle, there was about £350 million spent on performance sport by the UK, uh, by UK sport. Thank you. Final question, if I may, Convino. Um, obviously, elite performance begins at the grassroots. You identify the, the children of today will become the, the track stars of tomorrow. Um, how do we get the culture right so that those kids are encouraged and supported uh, to, to be the best they possibly can be without leaving all of their peers behind so that the focus of the gym teacher or the, the sports coach um, is divided fairly so that they, the elite guys get the time, but so do the, does everybody else? Um, I think that's probably in the best shape it's ever been, if I'm being honest. I mean, as, a, as a former PE teacher, uh, it was always my job to make sure that every child in the class that you taught had the best opportunity to improve their skills, uh, the, the, the acquisition of that skill, to interact with their peers, to become more confident, to improve communication, all of those things. That's my job as a teacher. But then with another hat on, I would step on and, uh, and, and, and become a coach after school. Um, where we were looking at young people who had potential, ambition to explore, and it's only that, to explore what that might look like and how the, the pathway would, would help them. Now, it's really important when we talk about a system um, that those <laughs> connections and those discrete areas are valued in their own right. Um, getting young people active is not purely for the outcome of, of performance sport. But for a few, it will be. Um, but the bulk of what we're doing is just making sure that taking part leads to participation outcomes and all sorts of other outcomes that are maybe wider than that. So we're, we use a phraseology which is about changing <coughs> lives through sport, and we passionately believe that there's the potential to do that, both as individual units of schools, clubs, Sports Scotland, but collectively, there's a real good opportunity. So I think the balance is in a good place. There's more work to do. We're very... Uh, our chair, who can't be here today, uh, Mel Young, is actually down with UK Sport today trying to help them improve their system. And uh, without putting too fine a point on it, we would like to see a greater degree of integration and alignment between UK Sport and ourselves and British bodies and the Scottish body. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Whittle, did you have a brief supplement? Yes, just a quick uh, supplement. Good morning to, uh, to the panel. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's just to move on uh, to, to, to do further on to Alex Cole Hamilton's question there around the, the link between uh, uh, Sports Scotland and UK funding uh, or UK uh, UK uh, sport funding. It's my understanding in the the um, uh, at, at the very elite level that the funding um, for our elite athletes and the podium athletes comes from UK sport. Um, and if I'm correct, that, that's something to the tune of about 12 million. Is that right? That, that, that goes directly into the uh, our elite athletes. That that that's the funding. Their funding comes out, doesn't come out of Sports Scotland. It now comes out of UK Sport once they get to that podium program. Is that correct? Yeah, no, it's absolutely correct. And uh, in, a, in an ideal world, that's the that's the solution we're looking for. So our our responsibility in in helping the the UK or the British system is for us to develop the system in Scotland to make sure there's a pathway for athletes as many young people are taking part as possible and that's broadly resourced there's tiny amounts of money might come in for small projects but broadly that's what we do as soon as they step onto those podium programs UK sport and the British body take over 100% responsibility while they're on that program there is a bit of you know that yourself there is a bit of to and fro so athletes can step off the program or be removed from the program either permanently or temporarily, and we would then pick up some support for them at that point, which is the ideal way, again, of, of how the system would work. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Miles Briggs. Thank you, and good morning uh, <clears throat> to the panel. Um, I wanted to touch on the school estate, which you've already mentioned. Um, I've raised this a number of times in committee with regards to Edinburgh and different charities who have been trying to get access to the school estate and the costs and ability to do that. And I just wondered, in terms of your experience, how you've seen that improve, potentially, and if there's any certain uh, local authorities who have actually made um, some of these challenges go away for accessing our school estate? 
just we did a research a, a, a few years ago on that, and I think there's a lot of perception there that says the school state's not opened and it's not being used. From that research, we identified that 89 percent of the school estate's actually being used. And what we did was talk with our local authority partners around what does that look like. So we worked with them around what's happening within them, how do they plan better, how do they prepare better, what's actually happening, and how could they capitalise on that for local communities. Where we did have some real success was around Glasgow, who really looked at that and took their whole school estate and their community estate and started working that, and again in East Lothian. And it's again how they plan and prepare for that. So I see real improvements in that and the opportunity to really combine using the local school estate with the community estate to provide more opportunities. So there's real progress there. In, um, in recent weeks, um, Edinburgh City Council, for example, have um, gone back on a decision to increase um, hall charges, um, which I welcome and had been pressing for. Um, Given the financial pressures which local authorities are already telling us they are coming under, um, are you concerned that access to schools and to sports are going to be really challenged in this environment? Because unless there's a noise made, often these things become the easy, low-hanging fruit to, to increase charges on. Um, <clears throat> well, we were part of that conversation, and, and this is what we would try and, and do. I mean, the, the essence of, of what Jackie, uh, what we talked about earlier on is we, we see local authorities as vital partners. The, their arm's length bodies are key in, 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 in working together. But what we're, what we're trying to do is to make sure there's um, a clear plan for access. And in some, in some cases, our strategic conversations will cover that. But on other occasions, it just comes out of the blue. Now, we have to be able to react to that. Um, it's our job to try and work with local authorities to try and persuade them of the best ways in which we, they can use their resources, how uh, they can make the most of their facilities, and allow as many people to, to participate. Of course, everyone has challenges with resources at the moment, but our job is to work closely with local authorities and their partners to try and persuade them of the value to communities of sport and physical activity. And it's really important to do that. And we will continue to advocate uh, uh, that to all of them. Thank you. Um, one, to go off uh, on a tangent here, one of the issues which um, had been raised with me last week um, following um, you know, everyone talking about Andy Murray and his um, movement towards retirement um, was actually where we go in Scotland with tennis, because I think there's a great opportunity. And I know you'll be aware of the discussions um, around the new elite centre in Stirling. And actually, I think the whole Murray family saying they don't feel that's the direction of travel, specifically um, in terms of developing... Um, a wider pool of players and actually additional coaches across our communities. So I just wondered, in terms of not just tennis, but in terms of a future model, um, where would you like to see that go? Because I think in many sports we do have an opportunity to grow that. Stirling is a fantastic campus, don't get me wrong, but um, for people, and especially for people taking their children um, from different corners of our country, it's not particularly easy. So I just wanted to um, find out your, your views on that in the future. I think it's, a, it's an interesting point and it's probably a bit broader than that if you, you, you're looking at one aspect specifically in tennis around that high performance component that will be at Stirling but um, it does link further down into what we do with tennis below that so what are they doing along, along the pathway with other partners and in, in the clubs and in those local communities uh, and tennis is a very facility focused sport as you, as you know we, we do have um, our indoor tennis fund which we are partnering with the LTA and Tennis Scotland on as well to expand that so so whilst the high performance centre at Stirling will be one piece of the jigsaw in partnership with the LTA and Tennis Scotland uh, it's not the only piece of the jigsaw and that's how we look at it systematically across all the sports there's the grassroots components that Stuart and Jacqueline have talked about in terms of getting children active and getting them participating and then how do they connect into those clubs where they're minded or motivated to try and become a world champion or a next world champion or you get to the Olympics, then the opportunities are there through the, the steps through those clubs and through those coaches into those development programmes, as we'll call them, that, that the Scottish governing bodies have. Uh, and that that's improved a lot. And we are starting to see that through the performances ultimately at the top end. We're seeing you know more, more athletes getting into GB teams, more athletes representing Scotland and better performances on that world stage as well. And Sorry, yeah, final uh, question. In terms of um, 
you know, the school estate and actually different schools, because I think independent schools in Scotland um, still seem to be offering more opportunities. How do you think we could, um, you know, if you had your, your opportunity to say this has to happen in schools, in state schools, to actually have more access? And you said, uh, Mr Harris, you used to do training in the evenings. Is there... Any opportunities we're not taking up to actually grow the number of coaches available within our school sector as well? Um, probably a, a key premise for us is to see whichever facilities are available used to the maximum. Now, what we're beginning to see around community sport hubs is exactly that. So it's always difficult when you when we separate things and we look at the school piece and the community piece. But what, what you see with a community sport hub is a clear connection with physical education, with the after school programmes that we support with, with active schools and then the, an extended community programme. And if, if I could see some of those schools, and some of them are open to very late in the evening, that's the way to take it forward. So it's a, it's a capacity issue. And of course, there are still some issues that we will continue to advocate to local partners about increasing that access. And uh, the school estate report that we did, okay, it's a few years old now, but I don't think the principal would be a million miles away. The, the school estate is accessible, it's open, but there are still some, there's still some capacity available. And that's the piece that probably consistently over committee reports or committee sessions that we've wanted to continue to push that button to make sure we try and create more access to those facilities. And it's all encompassing. So there's all aspects of the community, all aspects of programmes, and if you know, genuine offer, if any of the committee members want to have a look at a community sport hub in their area, we'd be absolutely delighted to try and facilitate that. And you could see just what's beginning to happen mm -hmm. in developing that community capacity going forward. I think just Thank another. You. Just on that, that convener, just I think we have to recognise the work that our local partners and our schools and our teachers in schools are doing in schools for our children and young people. And I think Active Schools is a great example. Stuart's mentioned 14 years it's been there. You'll see from the participation figures that 45% of the school role are participating from our equality standards. It's given equal opportunities across all the areas that reach into the school. So I think we have to acknowledge the work through education, through our local partners around all of that and then the connection into the clubs, into the community to try and give the pathways so those young people get the chance in school, but they've also got then the link into the club. And most importantly is the network of people, active school coordinators, community sport hub officers, and our officers in governing body to try and improve those opportunities so that there is parity around that. And I think that's the real difference over the last five, ten years of the system approach to that, which is really encouraging along to where we are. Thank you. George Thank you, Gavin. It's just very, very short supplementary. It was just an interesting, Jacqueline, because Miles didn't pursue it any further. Is if I got this right, you said 89% of school estate is being used and is accessible because that is uh, as a former councillor and now MSP. Uh, you know that's not been the kind of. Well, if you speak to sports clubs, they don't believe that's the case. But it's uh, just if you can give me some more detail on that information. So, so the research we undertook was going out to all our local partners and they fed back in around what, what the size of the school estate, what goes on it. And the information that we brought back, then we spoke with our local partners about the authenticity of that and how that was being used. And then we worked with them to say what's planned. I'm not, when I say, did you say successful? Well, I said it's accessible. accessible so when people right. are accessible no, and people are using it. Yeah, but that's what came back from the research, from that information from our partners. Do you know, it's maybe not always what people want to be on in it that's mm. happening in it, but it certainly was accessible. That's what I mentioned earlier on, is there is still some capacity mm -hmm. without a shadow of a doubt. And we, we've we always taken a view as a national agency that will work with all 32 local authorities. We've got good reach, good history, good track record in doing that, but that allows us really to get into those conversations. Because we've got the active school coordinators in every school, we've got information on the accessibility and the use of. There is definitely some capacity remaining, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to work with each individual local authority to free that up, to access it, to plan the access, because it really needs to be thought through about how you use your estate and where you have different types of activity. Uh, a little bit of sophistication actually reap uh, huge rewards. Okay, uh, further brief supplementary, Brian Whittle. Follow that. Um, George Adams, question. I think one of the things I would like to ask, Although you say 89% of the school estate is accessible, it's 
Would you agree that it's when it's accessible and to who that's important? So, for example, if it's if the estate, for example, is for clubs from six, seven o'clock in the evening, um, I would suggest to you that the that, that, uh, the impact of having that estate available at four o'clock in the afternoon or half past three when the school closes, uh, where the kids don't have to go home and then come back again, is hugely important and has a hugely significant uh, impact, especially in the most deprived areas where cost is an issue. Would, is that something you would agree with? I guess that's the planning ap application of the planning for that, when we actually are looking and working with our local plan our local partners in schools around what's actually going on. So what's happening from the three to six o'clock slot in schools, what's active schools putting on in the school time, how's that then connecting cl to clubs, how do they replan and focus what's going on in the evenings. And really it's all about going back to the kind of principles of community sport hubs, what do local clubs and what do local communities want? And that's where we've had some traction of really developing some of that. So that, that principle is exactly what we're trying to achieve. It's not easy across all of the country. You know, we, we can't dictate that at at all or where that is, but actually our partners, we're working with our partners to see where that can get better. Okay. I, mean, I, think, I think that's been of interest to, to a number of members and it would be useful to us all, I think, if you were able to provide some more substance to that, uh, and particularly you mentioned the, the, the different time slots and so on, I think that would be of interest to colleagues if you were able to provide that, that would be great. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Um, I came across a spreadsheet from Sports Facility Fund investment summary from Sports Scotland and over the 2014 to 2017 there seems to be 171 projects funded 32 are in my South Scotland region which has finance ranging from 14 and a half thousand pounds to 300 thousand pounds so it's things to do with 3G pitches installation tennis courts changing facilities so this would support community hubs, I suppose, and uh, I think this is actually a good news story about the amount that's been invested in places across Scotland, but uh, as I mentioned, 32 in the South Scotland region. So I am uh, keen to hear a bit of detail about the working with the local authorities in order to support these kind of uh, further facilities. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a number of facets. I mean, it's probably important to say that we've had an extended relationship with local authorities for almost 20 years now, and all 32. So what we will do with them is try and connect into their local needs and their local plans um, for both uh, the ambition to have people take part and, and, and access uh, activity, how they are going to try and do that. Um, so what's their local plan saying, how that local plan is connected across the community planning process. Um, and we'll then try to add some value to that. So where we where we see we can contribute, we'll look to put in place active schools coordinators, we'll look to put in community sport hub officers, and the facility piece is very much based on needs locally. Uh, we've had a good experience, thank you for your comments about um, about the investment so far. We've, had, we've invested a significant amount of resource over a number of years, probably around about 168 million pounds over those years, which is a lot of money. We do believe, though, going forward, that we'd like to, th to target this a bit more, to really look at communities with socio-economic challenge, where we think we can produce and support greater capacity to be built in some of those areas. So in f a feature of our new plan going forward will be to do exactly that, is to try and work much more closely with local partners to meet their needs. We're not an agency that dictates. We're an agency that's partnership-oriented to fulfill local needs. Uh, and that will, will remain the case. It's also, if I'm being honest, the most effective way to achieve the outcomes. There's no point in us putting something in place that doesn't fit what that local need actually is. Well, um, a couple of weeks ago, I attended the Under-18 Ice Hockey World Championships for females in Dumfries at the Ice Bowl, and it was fantastic. Yeah. And I had a chance to speak to Bethany Schoon, who's the assistant captain for the Great Britain Ice Hockey team. So. Um, she's the senior captain, so it was interesting to hear the the challenges for you know getting young lasses to play ice hockey because of the cost of equipment and padding and you know all of that. So how can Sports Scotland help support the the ice hockey teams? Because right now they're working well in partnership with UK agencies as well. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one, and it's very 
but it's very different challenges for different sports, just in terms of the you know the, the cost to participate or the cost for equipment, etc. Uh, we we have through you know some of our lottery investment, we, we have a um, what's the name of it? The lost in awards for all. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jacqueline. Sorry, had a, a mental block here. We have awards for all where clubs can apply and it can cover things you know like that where they have uh, equipment challenges or they want to train coaches or you know put people through. Um, additional training or, or support so that that's you know relatively small sums it's less than ten thousand pounds but it's for that it is based on that local need and it is community based as well and we've had you know a lot of success with that in terms of awards like that so the example you gave around a, an ice hockey club then that would be something depending on what their need is they can they can access that fund and that's an open application fund um, that, that we manage and we administer um, on that so that type of activity would be a an example of it uh, we also have um, direct club investment, which is something that we've done relatively more recently. In the last four or five years, we've recognised that not all the challenges clubs and individuals face are short term or one year. Some of those require a little bit more of sustained investment. And we have over 100 clubs that we've supported with that. And that can include uh, us supporting additional facility access costs for a period of time until they make it, try and make it more sustainable or find ways to sustain it themselves. Uh, it can cover additional coaching time and uh, if that's needed as well and other support areas as well and that can be up to four years that investment uh, and again that's that's an application based we have staff locally and in, in the governing bodies and their own teams that can work with those clubs to work up those applications but again that's based on the need of the club and the community need locally for it as well okay um, just a, a, another additional question about partnership working. In our briefing papers, the word NHS isn't mentioned, and the NHS is a big partner that social prescribing has become something that GPs are uh, keen to uh, participate. So for health and exercise reasons and not necessarily competitive sport reasons. So I'm aware that Tai Chi is something that people do to support pulmonary rehab. And that's an issue that uh, I think is worthwhile because it helps reduce hospital admissions if we can keep people healthier with their lungs. And uh, Greystone Rovers and Dumfries provide support and coaching and time for people with mental health diagnosis to play FIPA. So, and it's actually working really, really well. So I'm interested in any partnership working that may be developed with the NHS to look at uh, this kind of social prescribing aspects of exercise and health, but not necessarily to get people into competitive sport. Sure. Um, there's a couple of, a couple of elements I would probably, probably talk about here. We've tended not to look, there's a lot of this going on locally, huge amount going on locally, but we wouldn't claim responsibility for that. Yes, we've been part of those conversations, but these are local partnerships. What we're trying to do on a slightly bigger scale, and I think the committee will be interested in this, in the east end of Glasgow, um, there's been a, a, a consortium um, which includes NHL, NHS Greater Glasgow, it includes uh, Clyde Gateway, Community Safety, Glasgow Life, ourselves, housing associations. The conversation we've been having over the last 18 months is to look at how we can integrate all of our resources and we can all play a part in getting people active in that part of, of the city. Getting partnerships that actually mean something are actually very clear. So you've got the common outcome, just getting people active, as you say, keeping them trying to keep people healthy, particularly people who are not active. This is, for me, the way forward. It's connected back into that Active Scotland framework that we talked about, where every organisation, in my view, has a job to contribute to making the nation active. It can't just be about sport. So we are trying to develop, and we're looking to our colleagues in Active Scotland, to try and develop some national conversations with us, which I think would be more valuable. But I would reflect to you that locally, there are some fantastic partnerships going on. Jackie, you got some examples? I think of one of the examples is the, the strategy that we've just pulled together in Dundee. With Dundee, and, and that's not just that, it's a health strategy, sport. It's not, it's physical activity and health rather than just sport. So in there, NHS are leading in a whole area there around play and physical activity. We've also got the sport element of that. And that's an integrated strategy where we're seeing a lot of good projects locally that are being driven on the ground. Again, in Dundee, the links to the hubs and the geographical areas and health input into that. I think walking groups 
groups as well. So the Dundee example of that integrated strategy, which is about sport, physical activity and health, and how we're really making sure health is connected locally, is where most of that would go. And again, the one that Stuart's talking about in Glasgow is a real way for, forward for us as well. So we've got a lot of those partnerships. I think the important thing, again, for us as a community planning pa statutory partner as well, is where we connect with the community planning partnerships and the health and social care partnerships. And again, very much driven by our local partners in their context. So I know a lot of the work is going in the Highlands and Islands around health and social care, where they're really leading in a number of the strategies and sometimes on the health and sports strategy. So we're looking at different approaches to that, not only for communities, but for the children and young people as well. And I think that connect to the mental health area as well. With Sam H, there's a, a lot of work, again, not that we can take all the, the, the credit for that, but a lot of that's our local partners and where we contribute to a lot of that. So there's work going on. We recognise there's still work to go on, but you can see the difference in that real integration around national agencies. And just a final question is, it's about engaging older people. So you talked about walking, and there's obviously we've seen a rise in walking football and walking netball. Is that something that uh, Sports Scotland track the number of groups across local authorities to to manage trends of um, increasing that kind of um, participation? Um, we haven't tracked that yet, but because of it's been quite a, I think you said it yourself, it's been a swift uptaking a lot of that but what we what we are doing this this new cycle of, of planning is trying to pick up with local partners and national partners about what would be good to measure to look at impact so there's probably a huge number of things measured the job for us now is to filter out those that actually mean something so that is an area of getting older people engaged which i think is a much it's certainly got a lot more profile than it had before and that's a great thing because that message is really positive. So we don't have specific data right now, but we'll look to work with partners to make sure we actually get that in future. Okay. Some of our go live projects where we've got some of these adults participation around walking, football, the table tennis in Aberdeen, a lot of that. We've done some evaluation around that. So hopefully when that comes out, that's something we can share with the committee because we're seeing where we can get the inactive into more active and that that focus of that those projects, 92 projects that are out there. There's a number of those projects that show that and we'll have some information about that shortly. Okay, thanks. Uh, supplementary from Miles, please. Did follow him from Emma Harper's question because it reminded me um, when some of us in the Health and Sport Committee went to Avi Moore to visit the sports hub there, and what I came away from was actually one of the best practices they had was staggering um, the classes so that grandparents taking their children didn't just sit at the side and watch them. Um, in terms of that sort of best practice, are you? making sure that's being spread across Scotland. I know in Edinburgh it doesn't feel like that in some of our sports venues in terms of it seems to be all classes start on the hour and so it then becomes more difficult for families to, to actually do exercise themselves. Good they're taking their kids there, but how you have that intergenerational approach. I just wondered in terms of best practice being okay. spread. So we have a club and communities framework that we're, we're trying <coughs> across the country to give a consistency around that, to share practice. As part of our research approach, we also, as well as the data that Stuart updated on, we also have impacts and interventions, which is the stories coming from these groups and community where they were looking at best practice. So the Highland example with the fantastic head head teacher there at King Yusey, you know, that is across the country. There's lots of those examples and we share that. So we share it with our local partners. We share it around the networks of active schools, community sport hubs. I think, and more importantly, we also, the connection between the local authorities and governing bodies is really important so that our governing body people are seeing that. So again, when we're looking at the planning and programming locally, we've got these people acknowledging what's there because it goes back to the school, it goes back to what goes on in the community at night and really what's those community needs. So all of that, we're trying to really integrate, share practice and make sure that we know where good practice exists. Just, just to add slightly to that, um, a review in our consultation with the community over the last six months has, has shown that the whole engagement of parents, carers, families has been key. So our ambition in this next cycle coming up is to put resources into developing a partnership with education nationally and locally. Um, my daughter goes to a, a Brace High School in Falkirk and the head teacher is always looking for parental engagement not just in parents' evenings, but to contribute to the life of the school. So we think we can develop a, both a national and local partnership with schools on the general aim of getting more parents engaged in the life of the school. 
of mm -hmm. which we think we will benefit, sport and physical activity will benefit from that. So that's something coming up, just trailing that one. We've always done a lot of local work on parental engagement, but this is probably trying to take it to another level, to scale it up as such. Everything we do is really about that national scale. So taking some of those really good ideas and making it the principles accessible across the country. So looking at outcomes in a national scale and over the last four years, I guess a couple of things jump out um, uh, in terms of movement or, or lack of movement. One is that the number of Young people involved in active schools seems to be pretty static over the last four years. I think the numbers are around about 70% in primary school, 30% in secondary school. So, so maybe a lack of movement there where you might have hoped for some movement. Um, also, that drop-off between primary and secondary remains very significant. I think uh, the numbers of children uh, meeting physical activity guidelines over the course of a week was uh, is 45% in lower primary but below 20% by, by, by middle secondary. And, and finally, the, the gap between boys and girls, particularly through formal sports clubs, uh, seems not to be, not to be closing. Uh, I wonder what your reflections are on these important measures of success and, and, and what, what, what yeah. can be done to address them. I mean, I mean this, this, is, this is a really interesting conversation. Um, it's, it's probably important to say, and we've had a number of conversations with the committee about this in the past, there are those national figures, the household survey and the, the health survey, which, which show quite a degree of, uh, overall it's quite static, um, and there are some specifics that, that there are gaps. But what we've, what we've collected is data from every single school, which is around active schools. That's not specific around active schools. There's a general point I would make here. Um, it can't just be our responsibility to, to deal with that, you know, so our work with education, who have the young people in their care every day, I think is important to continue to develop that, so that we can look at what our contribution would would be. Of course, there's there's work to do, but I, we do see changes in those those trends in, in active schools, boys and girls. It's almost parity there around participation in active schools, and that's just that's not the general population. That's active schools as a program. And I think that's, that's important for us to look at, of course we accept and, and, and look at those national measures, but a lot of our detailed work is looking at specific communities, specific schools, and looking at how they can look at improving and closing some of those gaps, as you mentioned. I suppose the question is, yes, there is partnership work between Sports Scotland and education, but if it hasn't delivered the kind of level of change you might have wanted over the last four years, what is it that you need to think about doing differently over the next four years? Well, I, I would argue that active schools as a programme, and of course we try and engage more young people, has delivered against that. So there's a huge jump, um, the statistics. Uh, we can actually give you that most recent report as well. I think it's important, this may well be one that's important for your context. Uh, so the intervention, when we look at active schools as that intervention, it has been hugely successful, which is why we've kept it going for 14 years. It's £12 million of our budget, there or thereabouts, for 14 years. So for a national agency, we wouldn't have continued to do that if that had not been working. Now, we need to work around communities to bring more resources into, more capacity into those communities to get people with the ability to access. Of course, there's a mindset. There has to be an incentive and an understanding for young people. As I said earlier on, Kavira, my daughter's just gone into first year. She was really heavily into dance, and hopefully we'll keep her in dance and she'll get a huge number of new experiences in secondary school. That's the, the aim that I think we've all got for, for young people going through that school system. But we think our interventions that we have specifically worked through with local authorities has been successful. Uh, it simply strikes me that uh, your own annual review reflects on active schools numbers really remaining static over the last three or four years, uh, even if within that there may be some positive trends. Can, can I ask on, a, on another point, which is in relation to the measurement of physical activity in the health survey? Now, clearly, that's not your direct responsibility, but you use that to yeah. measure your own performance. Uh, the, 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 there may seem uh, something odd about numbers which suggest that children aged 13 to 15, um, only 18% are meeting the physical activity guidelines as measured there. But then when we get to look at adults from the age of 16 upwards, uh, the, the number meeting MVPA guidelines is as high as 65%. Now clearly these are not, 
these are apples and pears, but 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 is there a is there a need for a more consistent measurement between the under 16s and the over 16s in order to really track levels of physical activity as people grow up? Um, I guess we have to use the data that's available to try and data really helps us to begin to look at how we, you're correct, it's not just our responsibility, but we've got a huge contribution to make. We have to use that data to improve our planning against the outcome. So if that's what the data is telling us, then we have to improve that. So we'll continue to look at various ways in which um, young people disengage. And the key for us is to make sure when they want to re-engage, that there's an opportunity to do that. So you don't just accept the fact that there's that disengagement. You have to find other ways in which, at different points in that maturation of young people, that they can be motivated, both personally and through outside effort, to see the benefits. And it's, it's, we're, we're quite simplistic and quite open about the world of sport. World of sport. It's not a technical term. If you want to just run and jog, if you want to swim with your friends, let's just call it sport. Um, and let's just encourage as many people as possible to be with their friends, to have fun, and to improve if they want to improve. So this needs to be the aim that all of us have. But the point you're making is a good one. We all need to work closely together to try and improve the outcome of the, the data that we collect. Exactly. One, of, one of the other areas for us is we know that active schools is then an offer to all children, which is really so that universal approach is where we've been. We see that 6% increase. So over the 14 years, year on year, we see a small increase, albeit a small increase. But I think where we are now and in just where the, the whole agenda for young people is, is around can we take a more targeted approach with some of our partners? So we do know that the bell curve from that primary school into secondary school has stayed the same for, for quite some time. So again, we've just finished a series of meetings, 64 in total, with the, the, our local authorities and their respective trusts around where they're going in, in the next few years. And one of the things that's coming back there is how can we look at that 13 to 15 age group and look at the participation there? What interventions can we have for girls and young women as part of that, which is really important? And what we've found out from that, which again, hopefully as a committee won't come as a surprise, is what really works is when we consult with young people, we've asked them. So we've done a lot of work with a, a small group of girls and that there's some real examples up in Aberdeenshire, down in South Ayrshire, where we've set up girls committees to look at that and it's what do they want and what does that look like and we've suddenly, we've put, not suddenly, we've recently put together a whole Fit for Girls, it's a solution training so that we can go in and work in schools, work in the PE departments with where physical education is, work with active schools to see that that provision afterwards, what does that look like and I think that's something that's just been repetitive over the last 10, 20 years but I think what we're seeing is that intervention prevention talking to girls and young women, listening to them. We hope that will help change over the next period, but I think we need to just monitor and evaluate that. And the last thing we'll say on this is we're beginning now to look more closely at our stats around the equalities, which perhaps we had generic. So in the next few years, hopefully we'll be able to come back and, and create that picture as well and show that. Thanks. That's helpful. Yes, John Lund. Follow on. One of the other aspects to that, I think it is important to recognise that some of the choices young people have when they get to that 13 to 15 age group, and a lot of governing bodies and clubs have recognised that it's very difficult to retain and you know and maintain membership and, and from that young cohort. So with that, a lot of sports are looking at modified formats. You talked about walking football and, and bounce back to netball uh, as being two examples for older adults, but sports are starting to look at how they modify the games. You know, make small sided games. Reduce the time commitment for the games, make the games more inclusive and adapt the rules. So it is something that the sports themselves recognise, you know, as a challenge because you know that the, the young people that take part in sport today are the older people that continue to do it for the rest of their life, and that's really important for the sports generally as well. Thanks very much. Just back to uh, Stuart Harris and the point about the health survey and whether the, they are measuring the right thing and, and whether it's reflected in the right way. Uh, is this something that you're uh, engaging with other colleagues on? Absolutely, and as I said before, convener, the, the Active Scotland Outcomes Framework focuses everyone on that. So there has been a change in the data. Uh, just looking at the physical activity around children, there's a 33% figure there, which is a new figure. So there isn't a, any trend data on that one. It would probably be helpful if that maintained the measure mm -hmm. for the next week well, because it then allows you to see the trends. Uh, right, in, right at the moment, it's a, it's a bit of a one-off figure. But we continue to talk with colleagues the, the interesting thing is the Active Scotland framework 
it's on the website. There's a dashboard of measurements on there that we can all own. Every sector in Scotland can all own those and be part of a contribution to help get the nation active. Okay, thank you very much. Brief supplementary, David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, you were mentioning about active schools there and participation of uh, young girls in it. Do you measure the third sector, and I'm talking about specifically uniformed organisations who are very, very successful in getting uh, young girls into sport and offer physical activity um, every week, um, basically in their meeting halls and things like that. Because um, if you have a look at Scout Association, and I will put on record I am a member of the Scout Association. <laughs> We've got 51,000 members within Scotland, and we're offering that physical activity, sport and outdoor uh, uh, activities all the time. I guess one of the big things that Stuart mentioned earlier is our work in partnerships and, and we do have a partnership with Youth Scotland, with Youth Sport Trust and with Young Scott. So again, we are connecting to wider opportunities. So the system just now, if we just look inwardly at what sport contributes, one of the things for us now is how we look outside of that. So we've had a really good relationship with Youth Scotland and the uniformed organisations bringing in how can we use sport to add value to what they do, how does sport contribute to that. So again, the work now and the change in life through sport as well where we're beginning to look at different organisations coming around that table. So that's where we see that opportunity to really work with young people. If you're involved in those, you know the difference they can make. And one of the interesting things for us around what we also have is our young people sport panel. And we're now in our fourth kind of iteration of that. And it's just fantastic when you see this group of 16 year olds from across Scotland, from a variety of different backgrounds, really helping shape and influencing because we're listening to their voice and just going to the girls and, 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 and boys participation. And the interesting thing for us around our leadership programmes, Young People Sport Panel, Young Ambassadors, the actual percentage of females taking part in the leadership is greater than actual boys. So we get more girls and young women participating in leadership than actually participating. There's something in that that I think we need to kind of look and, and, and listen to. So we're working with the young people to really engage that. And the Year of Young People, I think, helped bring a lot of organisations together to share what we're doing and, and share the value that young people have. So I think there's a great opportunity because I think what John said, they are the future participants. They are the future of the leaders in our country. So that's an area I think over the last five years we've really developed significantly and with our partners in education. Thank you. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Gavina. I'm always interested in, in, the, in these surveys uh, and, and the, the outcomes of these surveys because I suppose it's really depending on what question you ask. Um, you know, I think the household survey, I think it was a huge trick missed there uh, in terms of what they were asking of people, are, are you active? Um, what they didn't follow up was, why are you not active? Would you like to be active? And if you'd like to be active, why are you not active? Um, I think uh, that would have been much more uh, illuminating, I think. The, but I'm looking here at the, the, the proportion of children aged between 2 and 15 who participate in sport. Uh, and there's a huge market difference between the, the most deprived and the least deprived. Uh, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a 30 point spread there. I mean, 82 percent of, of, of children from the least deprived participate in sport compared to 52 percent in the most deprived. And, 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 and the interesting anomaly for me here, like, actually, is there's more girls participate in the least deprived area but there's less girls in the most deprived area. So I think there's something within that. So I'm wondering whether or not, you know, we're asking the right questions. I think there's gaps here in our knowledge for me. It's, it's around that, why are you not active? And, and, and is there any work you think that's ongoing or, or any work you consider to, to, to so, fill that gap? <coughs> this is a, I know that's a great question again. So we, we can take into account those national indicators. They're a moment in time and they tell us a bit of a story. But what we're finding is when we when we look locally at what's going on, so a, a good story for me, I spent a bit of time up in Inverness in the Inverness Academy cluster and the um, the active school coordinator there, hugely professional, <coughs> absolutely committed, spent most of her time identifying those young people in that school, in that community that were not active. So through that work in the school, targeting young people who <clears throat> she knew were obviously not participating in anything at all, began to shift some of that. So for us, it's very much about those local solutions. The, the national indicators, they tell us a story. 
they're a moment in time picture. So we'll, we'll, we'll take that on board. But what we're finding really useful is when you get down to and ask those questions, and active school coordinators are mandated to continue to ask those questions. So if there are young people not participating, it's why not. Jackie talked about hearing the voice of young people. More and more, we're listening to that. But it's a local solution for that. The national picture doesn't really help us talk about the primary school down the road or in my hometown of Dundee, the school estate in Dundee. It doesn't happen. We've got to really get into those schools, mm. which we've been committed to doing <coughs> over the last 14 years. And I think it's shown some benefit. We'll have to continue to do that. Going forward, I talked about our connection with, with an ambition to get more parents engaged in the life of the school. We will be targeting much more uh, our, our asset, our resource, active school coordinators with partners into those schools who are maybe showing lower participation. So we're going to try and increase the impetus, increase the resource available to those schools to try and get young people and give them additional opportunities. That's all we can really do is plan better, look at interventions that are both for everyone and also targeted. We can't move that around. So we think, yes, national figures tell us a bit of a story, but I put a lot more store in what's happening in individual schools and individual clubs and communities about activity and how people uh, access it. As part of our wider evaluation of the Act of Scotland Outcomes Framework, we did ask a number of those questions, so we've got a report we can share the findings of that with you around some of the questions we've asked and particularly around some of the areas we have and show how that we have that information that's asked them, how you're feeling, have you been inactive if you didn't do this, so we can share that information with you. I think, yeah, I think, you know, if we, if we, cut, if we cut to the chase, I think we, we've discussed this before, uh, Stuart, I think that this, this, it's not rocket science here. I think, you know, the, 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 you've discussed this idea of, of, of um, linking up work within physical education with community and the club offer. Um, for example, I, I don't see the point of, of doing six weeks of, of introducing kids to basketball in school if there's then no outlet for them uh, locally. Um, I suppose we talk about you know ease of access and the cost of access, which you've, we've alluded to today as well. I mean, we, we have we have a, a, a number of, of clubs, especially post Commonwealth Games, with with waiting lists. So that tells me that there are kids out there who want to participate who who are not getting that opportunity. You've also talked about this this idea of, of utilising the school estate more efficiently, where. I've never understood this idea of, of, of kids having to leave a facility, go home and go somewhere else to participate when they're actually where, they, you know, where, where the facilities are. So I think what I'm saying to you is you know, we're in general agreement in terms of the, the, the direction of travel we need to go in here. So given, given the, the, dis the discrepancy between most deprived and least deprived, what are the barriers to implementing that, that kind of overall plan? Um, well, this, this, will, this will definitely be location-specific, mm. right, without any shadow of a doubt. I'll probably just take issue with one of the things you said. I, I, I'm a great believer that there's a connection. Totally, you and I have talked about this a lot. But if, if there's a demand from young people for basketball, say, mm. uh, and yet there's no club in the community, then it's incumbent on those who are there to try and provide those op opportunities to try and provide it in the community. So mm. the, the, the connectivity would be... Yes, it's taught in school, it's part of a PE curriculum, it's an after-school club. And then ourselves, uh, supporting local professionals, should be looking to build a club. Now, what, what, what we are seeing is that we're seeing in areas of socioeconomic challenge, we're seeing participation in active schools with a positive intervention. It's almost parity. But what we do see is in the club infrastructure, and here's the barrier for you, there isn't enough capacity in those areas um, to allow young people the choice of, participa of participating in the community. So we need to work with local partners. The evidence is really clear that in school it seems to be working, but across in the communities there's a lack of capacity. So again going forward in our new cycle, we would want to spend more time with partners looking at how we look to construct, use the available resources, don't have to be sp brand spanking new shiny, resources and facilities that are available in communities where there's a lack of infrastructure. Our part in that will be to bring governing bodies together. As you can imagine, if there are 10 sports wanting to talk to one community, that's a bit resource intensive. 
we can, I think, help this, where we can maybe bring the governing bodies closer to the communities, but as a group, and begin to look at how we build that capacity. So it's pretty clear that if you take positive action and you make sure that there's a extended, sustained, long-term commitment, as is in active schools, physical education, it's long-term, sustained part of education, but there's work to be done in communities about how we build that capacity and give communities the opportunity. I think that community sport hubs are a vital part of that, <coughs> where communities have the opportunity to do things for themselves with support to try and make opportunities available for their community. And we are hugely passionate about that. Um, so we're changing the model around from being delivery oriented from local partners, delivering programs, mm -hmm. to actually trying to build capacity in communities, which says that's your community. Here's the resource, here's the support available. You build it yourself and we will help you to do that. So the barrier for me is the infrastructure, Brian, there's just not enough of it. Mm -hmm. To, uh, look, to accommodate that demand. But it's something we all have to get our head around. I think, uh, if it, Sorry. We have very briefly, just, just on that very point, um, you, you've discussed around developing these community hubs. But at the same time, especially in the more rural communities, you have council-run facilities that are being shut and closed at, at, at a rate of knots. Surely that there must be a barrier to local communities uh, participating in any kind of activity. Yeah, I guess some of the rural communities we've like, acknowledged that and community sport hubs is a principle that's working really well in some of those rural communities by bringing people in the rural communities together to look at that. The, the one bit that I, I think just from what you said earlier, Brian, is around that barrier. One of the things we need to, I think, improve if we're going to look if the least deprived is around professionals working in the system. So sport, I think we contribute something, but what we really need to do in our work and changing lives is work with other partners. So work with the community learning development, work with the social work, work with other groups and communities that see the whole life of the people, the, the children and young people in these communities and really try to make a difference there. And we've just got additional money, again, from government, from Robertson Trust to look at partners as where we can actually look at this. We've just put out a million pound fund. We've got 17 projects, 35 partners that are going to go in and really look at this and a consortium working to really review it. So I think that's one way we can look at some of the challenge and the barriers you presented in the areas of, of, of most deprivation, which I think is new to the sporting world. We've got to learn. I think we need to be educated better. We need to listen to others, but we can bring that sport and physical activity component to really changing lives and, and making a difference so that there's a bit, bit more parity in that. We'll never change it overnight on our own, and, and we recognise that. Thank you very much. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, convener. Perfect timing, because my question is effectively going to be on uh, national lottery funding, but also uh, regards to sports hubs uh, in particular as well, because it, it will affect the cut, the ongoing year cuts of national lottery funding will affect uh, these type of things as well. And uh, I was interested in what Stuart Harris has said about every community in Scotland should have a community hub. Hope I haven't misquoted you because I totally agree with you. Uh, because uh, my in my constituency in Paisley, we've got uh, an area of deprivation, Fergusley Park, which is the lowest, the worst area. And in that uh, area, we have St Martin Football Club right in the heart of Fergusley Park. And we've constantly worked in a programme to try and use the football club as a, 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 for the UWS, for for uh, West College Scotland, you know, educational attainment as well, using the football club and sport and a multi-sports complex as a way forward to actually trying to make a difference in that area. Now, the one problem I do have in this whole project, myself and 13 other fans, 1,300 other fans bought the club, but we have a situation where we have a funding issue and obviously our first pay up, uh, people to go to would be to talk to yourselves and when we've built up the programme it would be to National Lottery who have already said that they think this is a good plan type of thing that they would invest in but we need to get it together. But my concern and I, my question would be, I wonder if you share this concern, is projects like this with this year on year cut from National Lottery funding, it's projects like that that are going to suffer. My big concern is that when we're trying to get this together, the programmes like this, it's not just us that are doing it, it's happening all over the country, there's going to be an extra impediment, an extra challenge put in your way. Um, well, l let me agree with you. I share your concern about the drop in National Lottery funding. Um, just for context for the committee, three years ago we had 31.5 million. We're now down projecting about 25. But let me reassure you, um, we, when we have 
financial challenge, we make sure we prioritise. So again, I can assure you sitting here, community sport hubs, the community element of what we do is a priority. So we would look at other aspects of where we could make efficiencies, savings, or we may have to park something for a moment because of the prioritisation process that we have. Now, as a CEO, that's quite challenging for me to ask the team to do that. Everyone sees important things in their own piece of work, but it's really important that when we do have some challenges, we do make a, take a prioritisation process and a, a, we take it through a process of prioritisation and not just a salami slice approach. So be reassured that's what, 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 we, what we do. So I would encourage, we're encouraging communities to continue to talk to us about what's happening in those communities. And we'd be, we probably have more to do with football clubs, I think. I think there's a potential there. We've got a conversation, George, that we're having with, uh, with Scottish Rugby about, again, similar uh, methodology around bigger sports and their capacity to support other activity uh, around that. So hopefully I've reassured you the, the issue around uh, lottery is challenging. Um, I, I must thank the Scottish Government for the fact that they have committed to an underpin for the income and for us to allow us to plan, that's really positive because if we didn't have that £3.4 million, then the variable uh, in t planning terms, if we have £31 million one point and we have 25 the next, you could see how challenging that would be in planning terms. So we we look forward to continuing to prioritise those kind of programs. So if there's any conversation that's required, we're happy to do so. Yep. Uh, one of the one of the things, just in the back of, obviously, he's mentioned about the Scottish Government doing 3.4 million to mitigate against uh, these cuts, because uh, uh, this, this government's already said we will, in the budget, we will work with Sports Scotland to protect sports investment and uh, ensure that the impact of continued reductions of the lottery income to mitigate against them. Now, one of the things that when you're looking at all this, can I ask you, just, just in more detail, because you said that you would have to look at things in more detail and have to look at making savings elsewhere as well, but what, these continued cuts, what, what is the impact on your delivery on a national level and being able to actually, when you're looking at uh, your programme and what you want to do, you know, can you just give us a taste of what it's like for you? Well, it's actually very positive. Of course, there are challenges around resources and choices that we all make, but we use the outcomes that we're looking for. We look at the impact we believe we're having through data, results, what partners are saying to us. We use all of that. Um, so from our perspective, our investments have always been big infrastructure projects in the main. So we're looking at active schools, we're looking at community sport hubs. These are all big priorities for us. So we'll manage around those priorities. We'll be as efficient and as effective as we can. We'll always look at ourselves first if we have to make reductions about what where the resources are. And it's really important that we continue to do that. The key, though, is trying to get best value. And again, this is the, this is the, the work that underpins everything we do in all of those circumstances, is that partnership working. Mm -hmm. So it's the combining of resources with local partners, with ourselves, adding some value to that. And we think that that's in a pretty good place. It will have to continue, though, and we'll have to redouble those efforts to make sure that we um, make the most of that. And we'll continue to advocate to yourselves and others that sport and physical activity is a, is a value-for-money product across the piece. Just one final question very quickly is just the fact that, uh, just to go back to the sports hub idea, you know, the whole idea of uh, using our uh, professional clubs, we've found in Renfrewshire with some of the work they've done with St Monland and St Monland Community Trust, that young people in particular will gravitate towards the football club more than they would with someone, a similar qualified individual coming from Renfrewshire Council. And uh, is it not the case that we, we need to do more and more work like this with clubs like that in order to have that impact, even not just in healthy lives and sport, uh, also with the opportunity of uh, the edu uh, educational attainment gap as well, make sure that young people stay within education and using sport as that catalyst? Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we would, uh, we've had lots of conversations with SFA. We're, we're always trying to encourage, George, as you can imagine, the governing bodies to take on a lot of this role. We can't do everything. But for us, we see as a national agency, there needs to be a conversation with SFA and local clubs about the potential that, that, that football clubs can play, uh, along with rugby clubs. There's a big infrastructure there. 
in terms of facilities in particular that we need to start engaging. I recognise the good work that's already going on, though. Okay, thank you very much. David Torrance. Thank you again. Um, I ask, how successful has Sports Scotland been on delivering on the outcomes set out in the 2015-2019 uh, corporate plans? Uh, are there any specific ones? Well, just generally, how successful do you think you've been? Well, generally, we, we've, we've aimed. So uh, the way we set out the plan, so the plan is the outcome that we're always looking at is, is people taking part. Yep. So we would look at how that happens locally, and then we would also take a step back and look at what we contribute to that. So our, our assessment of that is that we have seen increases over each year around our big investments across active schools and community sport hubs. We've seen process and system improvements around performance sport, the interrelation between governing bodies, our own staff at, at the Institute, about making better use of, of those resources and giving young people, young athletes, the ambition and the potential to, to, to step forward. We've seen increases in um, the people we support directly and we could give you all of the detail from our report on all of that. So we feel that when you look at the system, and just to remind the committee, it was it's around schools and education, clubs and communities and performance, all connected. We've got people and places and actually critically the stories that we all tell that really bring it all to life, make it all happen. And the partnerships we have are, are really important. So we think it's been a positive four years. We've reviewed all of that. We've listened. We had over 1,200 contributions to our consultation, uh, some of which were encouraging us to do more of what, some of what I've told you, and actually others telling us, what about a little shift over here? The parental engagement one came from big consultation input from partners across the piece. So our job now is to build on that, to take to government our corporate strategy going forward for you probably don't need the years because this is based on principles, but from 19 onwards, we want to build on the success we've had so far. There is still lots to do though, but the mechanism that we assess is the strength of our partnerships. And with governing bodies and local authorities and their partners, we think we're in a good place. Yes, there are challenges, but as a national agency, we are probably getting good results that we can reflect on because of the strength of our partners. David. Looking ahead, she says um, you've had over 1,200 uh, individuals um, or groups reply back to you. Is there any your priorities of change in Sports Scotland because of that input? Um, I would prob I mean, we've always had an underpin of inclusion. It's always had an underpin for us personally. But what we feel is that we need to play a stronger role, and this is quite a big piece, in coordinating an inclusive effort into uh, equalities. So it's, in a, and for us, the, the area for, that we would be looking at is a massive priority, which we've always covered it, but we would now begin to target more resources from ourselves, but also partners into areas of socioeconomic challenge. That would be a, 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 num a priority for us that underpins everything we do. And it would be really important over time, because I think we talked about trends earlier on, if we can over time, over the next four years, begin to see some shift in the results of both the, the infrastructure available, but also the impact that those infrastructures, and by, by infrastructure I mean people as well as places, actually begin to have. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. And a very brief supplementary from Emma Harper. Thank you. It's just to clarify what uh, George Adam was bringing up. You talked about parking certain projects and using um, Sports Scotland money to underpin what has been reduced by UK government lottery funding or lottery funding. So I'm interested, are the projects that are part, the big projects like the 3G pitch that costs 300,000 or is it, and then you'll fund weir projects across Scotland. How, how do you decide which projects to park? Well, we, we, t we take a, just trying to emphasize to the committee, we, we try and take a needs based approach. So we won't make these decisions in isolation, but we'll look at, we'll look at what's, what we have available. The one area we have reduced, but we haven't taken anything out, is we've had to reduce our capital investment because that had a huge reliance on um, on lottery. Mm -hmm. However, at this moment in time, I think we're going to look at it again and look at where we can get the best impact from the resources that we have, both combined <laughs> government and 
watery resources. And we're also beginning to look at how we engage with the private sector and look at how there may be resources made available there. So we try, when I'm talking about parking thing, I, I'm not a huge fan of the word cut. There's a strategy that you would have at a particular time that meets the needs in a particular area or with a governing body. We'll look to try and prioritise what those needs are. Of course, as I said earlier, we'll continue to make the case that what we do and partners do is great value for money for the Scottish public purse. Um, and we'll continue to make those arguments and, and provide as much evidence we can as the case. But in every business, you, 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 you'll probably talk to lots of people, there are times where you will prioritise things, uh, activities over others. And we have to just continue to do that on a, uh, an annual basis. It's probably a, the, the cycle that we work on. We'll take a, we're in, in the moment of a four-year plus look currently, but we'll make those decisions based on what people are telling us and what we think the needs of the partners are. We do not impose and we, don't make, we, we do not try and determine what local people want to do for themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I thank the witnesses for their attendance this morning and uh, for the offer to send us some further information as we've discussed. Thank you very much. We'll suspend briefly and then uh, take evidence from the Minister in, the, in, in two minutes' time. Instrument. As is usual with such instruments, we will have 
Uh, first of all, we will hear from the Minister and his officials with an opportunity to ask questions on uh, uh, issues arising from these regulations. So, may I welcome to the committee once again Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing. Good morning. Uh, Robert Swanson, QPM, the Chief Inspector of Crematoria. Joanna Irvin from the Legal Director and Cheryl Paris from the Burial and Cremation Team at the Scottish Government. Uh, Minister, may I invite you to make an opening statement? Thank you, Convener. So I'm delighted to join you this morning to consider the Cremation Scotland Regulations 2019, which will put in place a much improved framework for cremation in Scotland and introduce new application forms for those applying for a cremation. The death of a loved one is, for most people, one of the most difficult experiences we will ever face. Grief Im impacts on each of us differently, rousing different emotions and affecting the way in which we make decisions. It's crucial, therefore, that when a person dies, each agency or organisation involved at that time ensures they're respectful and sensitive to the wishes of the bereaved, maintaining the dignity of the deceased at all times. In 2017, approximately 65% of all Scottish funerals were cremations. That percentage has been steadily increasing and is expected to rise further in future years. Commission authorities and their staff, therefore, have an increasingly crucial role to play in the funeral market and in supporting the bereaved at a very difficult time. In 2014, following the examination of practices relating to the cremation of infants in Scotland, Lord Bonamy published his recommendations for the future. He noted that while the work of the Infant um, Cremation Commission was confined to the cremation of babies and infants, his investigation and recommendations may have implications more generally for older children and adults. And this has proved to be correct, and his recommendations, as well as those made by Dame Elish Angelini's National Commission investigation, will in part be implemented by these regulations. The regulations standardise cremation practices, putting in place clear and consistent processes at all cremations. They introduce new requirements on cremation authorities, which are specifically designed to prevent unacceptable practices that we've seen in the past. Failure to comply with these uh, requirements is an offence under the Burial and Cremation Scotland Act, and for the very first time we will set out procedures and timescales for handling and dispersal of ashes. In line with Lord Bonamy's recommendations, they increase record retention timescales from 15 years to 50 years, um, guaranteeing future traceability for families. They will require cremation authorities to create and publish management plans, which will improve transparency for the public, as well as keeping accurate and up-to-date registers of each and every commission that takes place. Each of the 30 crematoria currently operating in Scotland will be inspected against these regulations annually by our inspector, Robert Swanson, QPM. The regulations also introduce new application forms which distinguish between different types of cremation. The forms have been deliberately designed in this way to be sensitive to the individual circumstances, a recommendation of Lord Bonamy, and a view that was supported by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee during the passage of the Bill. Importantly, each form contains a separate section on ashes, creating a formal record of the applicant's wishes and introducing an additional safeguard for the applicant. The regulations and forms were formally, formally consulted upon in 2017, 40 responses were received and all the responses were supportive of the proposed changes. Since the consultation, we've engaged extensively with the Commission's authorities and others in the industry, and our approach has been welcomed by trade associations and business alike. We've produced comprehensive government guidance for the industry and will produce similar, similarly comprehensive guidance for the general public. We're also developing training materials for cremation authorities and funeral directors to ensure that they are adequately equipped to support members of the public. So I hope that members agree that these regulations bring about a positive change to an important industry that concerns us all with, the, with Parliament's support. And I look forward to the regulations taking effect from the 4th of April. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And, uh, uh, I have one or two questions, and I know one or two colleagues also do. Uh, First of all, you talked about procedures and timescales, and clearly some thought will have gone into the timescales that apply here. Uh, can, can you indicate uh, how those timescales were arrived at? And also, there is almost an in, in, implication that 
uh, uh, cremation authorities and funeral directors may operate longer timescales than the minimum that you have set. And again, what is that level of expectation and, and how will that be communicated? So um, you're absolutely right in terms that these are these are the minimum timescales. Um, the, the timescales that were arrived at were um, arrived at after discussion. They're roughly the average um, of what is in place just now. So clearly that means that in some cases there are much shorter timescales are, are currently being adhered to. So this will give um, a degree of um, continuity across the country and, and kind of making sure that there's nobody that goes below these levels. Um, but the, So these are these are the average, but I think it's likely that in some cases um, some crema crematoria will, will take a decision to go beyond beyond the minimum. Surely. And, and in terms of the processes for contacting relatives to seek... Uh, directions as to what should happen next. How will that be done and what will happen if there is no response uh, to those contacts? Yeah, so um, obviously the, 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 the flow chart details what happens at each stage sure. in, in terms of the initial four weeks and then a further four weeks and, um, and obviously it depends on where, um, you know, which, which part of the pathway you're, you're following. Um, the initial con the, 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 the Communication would, in general, be uh, written. So um, that would normally be, I think, by a, a recorded delivery letter um, or email, if that's the method that someone has indicated as their preferred choice of communication. I don't know, was there anything else we needed to...? No, I think that I think that's um, yeah, that's that's about it. So at the at the moment, it's it's usually a recorded letter just to make sure that the the letter has been received and has been has been properly received by the applicant. Um, yeah, if they decided that um, they wanted to be contacted by electronic means, then they could let the cremation authority or the funeral director know. And as long as it's in writing and there's a record that th those emails have been sent, um, then that's good enough for for the record. <coughs> The implication, I suppose, of, of the, the flowchart is that where there isn't a response, it's taken that there is no instruction or no intention to collect ashes. Uh, is, uh, will there be a way of confirming that impression or will that simply be a procedure that uh, crematoria and funeral directors will have to So, th I mean, there's then an additional four weeks. So, I mean, I, I guess th there is a degree of, you know, how many times would you keep keep trying... And do you hold ashes, ashes forever? So this, this is about get, getting a, a degree of consistent, <coughs> degree of the, the, uh, consistency before um, the ashes would then be um, scattered. So the, the ashes aren't lost, and, and obviously all that information is recorded. So if for for some reason, you know, 20 years down the line, somebody comes back and and, and want to be able to show their respects to a loved one that they've maybe. Had had lost contact with, they will still be able to do that because they will be able to a record of where the, the ashes were scattered. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, but so I, think, I think that's important yeah, in terms yeah. of. But, but there isn't there isn't an additional fallback, if you like. I mean, clearly, one of the issues <coughs> that arose in the cases we know about is where, in some cases, families have been very distressed and haven't responded to official communications in a timely manner. That clearly is is going to be a continuing risk. Um, but but. You're saying essentially there comes a point when you can no longer. Yeah, and so and I think that's why there's you know it's not just the four weeks. It's it's that, and then there's there's other checks and other checks and going going down. It's perhaps worth but, mentioning that of course you can only be dealing with the applicant, and there is very good reasons for that, especially when you're looking at pregnancy laws, for instance, and yes. such like. So you can't really go knocking on neighbours' doors, etc., to see about something that is confidential in the sure. extreme. So, so you that have a does means, restrict it. You have a means of communication and you simply stick to that means. Yes, and by I mean, the, the new forms give that extra information. You know, emails didn't exist as far as a requirement in the past, so that was a line of communication that they didn't have. So they have the email, they have the telephone that they can pass a message, say, contact us, as well as they have the home address now. So they've got these three areas. Sure. Thank you very much. Oh. Alec Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Um, thank you for coming, Minister, and thanks for the um, opening remarks. Just a couple of questions. Can you outline um, what, where we are in terms of the support offered to the families that were caught up in the original scandal around the uh, the baby ashes? On ongoing support. Yeah. 
Right, yeah. So at the time, um, the Scottish Government gave money to um, support agencies, I suppose, to um, help families who had come forward, who would who would like counselling or um, other other support in whichever way they can. I think we are at a stage now, I haven't certainly heard for some time of families who have been looking um, for new support. There are still families who are having ongoing support. Sands Lothian is a, is a charity that springs to mind and um, that continues to support some families. Um, so so the, the support still exists where, where families need it. I don't know if the demand's quite as high as it was initially, um, but yeah, the support's still there if, if, if families need it. Um, I, final question. I, I mean, it, it is clearer than I thought it was in the schedules, but in, in respect of um, stillbirth and, and the 24 weeks cut off, I mean, I, there's obviously it forms A3 in the schedules around cremation guidance that, that exists A3 and A4, which are um, either the mother or nominated individual can sort of take charge of the process or the, the hospital. How is that, um, is, is that entirely left down to the family as to whether they want the, the hospital to deal with the disposal of remains or, or they want to take that into their care? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really important um, point and it's, I think, why it's important that we do have um, the, 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 the different forms, so it's an appropriate form depending on the particular circumstances and also the, the, the different registration yeah, so and, and absolutely, it's for the family to decide. So um, wh when they are in hospital, they will have a conversation with the, the hospital staff and they can decide at that point or after, because we don't want to put any pr time pressure. So at that point or after, <coughs> whether they want to arrange the, the funeral themselves and they can go away and do that. And for stillbirth, I think most people do, or lots of people do, or if they wish the hospital to arrange an individual burial or an individual cremation, then they can ask the hospital to do that. And they can come back at, after a period of time and say, actually, we would like the ashes or... Yes, and they and they get yes. If it's a if it's an individual um, cremation, and, and they can they can say the upfront that they would like the ashes, so okay. that, yeah, they can get those. Okay. So specifically. On the forms, there's, there's, there's obviously a part about, about the ashes on, on, on all of the forms. And but, but understandably, some yeah. of them won't be getting... It won't and be is there clarity problem. made... Uh, is it made clear to the family that if they... You know, obviously, it's a, a very difficult time, a time of grief, that they just say, look, I, I just want you to deal with it. I don't want to know about it. Um, and then if they change their mind, uh, or is it made clear to them what will happen to the remains of their still birth or stillborn baby prior to 24 weeks? Yes, yes. It's, um, it's made clear to them up front what will, okay. what will happen. Um, and all the forms contain... The, so there's, there's hospital forms as well that the, the families will go through with staff. And it's, it's absolutely made clear to them if they choose this, this option, this is what will happen. If they choose this, this is what will happen. OK, thank you, convener. Thank much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm interested in the, the Infant Cremation Commission, which was chaired by Lord Bonamy, and he made 64 recommendations all of which were accepted by the Scottish Government. So um, I'm interested to know, have all the recommendations of the Commission been implemented? And are there, if not, are there still some that need to have further progress? So um, there's a large number of recommendations which have, have already been implemented. Um, there's 22, I think, recommendations which um, will be implemented along with uh, these regulations on the 4th of April and, and some other regs uh, on the 4th of April. Um, and that leaves, I think there are five um, which are, they've been implemented, but they're ongoing recommendations. So like, for instance, where the recommendation is that we um, keep under review. So obviously that will never be complete because we have to do that ongoing. And then there's a further five which have not yet been implemented. And three of those would be um, implemented under the um, code of practice that we would intend to bring forward for cremation authorities. So as that's been developed, then three would be dealt with um, under that. Um, and the fourth recommendation, number 40, um, uh, is one that we are we're working with in, in relation to software. So we're working with um, the crematorium authorities to ensure that software um, can be developed um, to, to help the crematorias um, meet the requirements of the regulations going forward. And then there's also reg um, recommendation 56, um, which 
relates to um, a national, which, which asked us to consider whether there should be a national um, memorial. And I think we've, we've said that, you know, if there was a, a major demand for that, then that would be something that we should consider right now. There hasn't been, I know there's a specific memorial being um, erected in, in Edinburgh. Um, and, and that might be the way that, that people want it rather than a national memorial. And I think we need to be mindful of, um, of, of what people's wishes actually are. So. OK. And just a, a final wee question. And like the, the Scottish government's the website with the information about updates or review or anything, that will just continue to be updated so that people know where to go to for information? Yes. OK. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Miles Briggs. Thank you. Ask in terms of all crematoria now in Scotland, um, <coughs> is it my understanding that all are now able to and are in a position to recover um, baby and infant ashes? Is that correct? Yes, uh, yeah. as, as I understand, 100%. But maybe Robert, do you want to give a bit more? Yes, that is the case, and I'm pleased to say that it's almost four years ago that I was appointed, which was really on the back of the, the Morton Hall issues. To be perfectly honest, the, um, there's been a 100% recovery of baby and indeed adult ashes uh, since that time. Not entirely down to the appointment of me, there's been so many other changes that's taken place on the back of that. For instance, baby modes have been fitted as well as additional training has been put into place. There's a, an appreciation of what has been happening and the staff have clearly alerted to all of that. So there's a lot greater care, there's a lot of more strict management guidance being given. There's lots of instructions and, uh, and then guidance given. And a, a lot of what's in place at the moment is there. It's not going to change all that much with the regulations. The difference being is at the moment it's the, the goodwill that they're actually all complying with uh, what they're being asked to do. Uh, the difference being that there will not be a request, there will be a requirement. And that's the, the major change. So in all honesty, it's come on a lot. Cognizance has been taken off all the, the problem areas and the problems that were, were seen and were well documented during that. And they've all been uh, contributed towards the success that we have. And I, I say it is a success, but it's what should be and what's expected, quite frankly. And there is no real reason now given the definition of ashes, uh, that uh, there will be instances uh, other than perhaps mechanical failure, uh, which you, you can't overlook. It mm -hmm. can happen. It has not happened to that extent uh, so far. Um, one of the issues which was um, raised at a cross-party group on funerals and bereavement was with regards to pauper's funerals, as they were known, in terms of no one coming forward and then the state um, you know, paying for that um, uh, cremations take place. Is this the same protocol? And how, in, in terms of contacting nobody who's registered, what sort of protocol would you follow in that regard? Yeah, sure. So the um, the primary legislation actually has a, a, a provision in there which will replace in a set of commencement regs that will hopefully will come in at the same time as these, which will replace the National Assistance Act. Um, so it's for local authorities to pay for and arrange the burial or cremation um, where there is no next of kin or there are next of kin but they cannot for whatever means arrange that. So what these regulations do is set out a new application form. Um, there have been some concerns in the past for example where ashes haven't been returned to a next of kin so where there's a next of kin but the local authority is um, arranging the funeral, ashes haven't been returned and um, this form makes sure that ashes will absolutely be returned. So where there's a next of kin, the, the local authority must ask the next of kin what they would like done with the ashes, how they'd like them to be handled and if they want them to be returned then they will absolutely be returned. So um, I think these regulations strengthen the position of next of kin um, but are still allowing local authorities to be able to fulfil their, their requirements under the Act. And could I just finally ask, in terms of the time scale around, you know, we mentioned four weeks or the eight week period, um, you know, where that was arrived at, especially I think um, members of the committee were maybe concerned that when people are in mourning, um, you know, four to eight weeks can sometimes be them being disturbed still um, and not ready to pick up these ashes. So I just wondered in terms of flexibility, because I think not, uh, from a lot of constituent cases I've had, there has been that flexibility in the past for people to say, when we're ready and so to make sure that that continues and not being too descriptive so so that that would absolutely be so if if somebody got back saying yes i want these ashes 
but kind of get a bit more time than you know I think in practice that that's something that is 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 respected now. What what these regulations do is put in place an absolute minimum. So if that if they haven't made contact, but 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 clearly that, that's the absolute minimum is that we are we're regulating for. Whereas currently there isn't an absolute minimum, yeah. and in some cases it's less than the, the time scales that we are putting in place. I mean they are very very flexible. Uh, you know, out of the thirty crematorium at the moment, I mean there's one I can think of. Uh, they've got a six month retention policy, a nationwide one. So, I mean, but they're flexible. I mean, we've had it where it's less than that. But, for instance, they might say that my brother's coming over on, for summer holidays from Australia. Could you hold on to the ashes until such time as he's here? That is not an issue at all. And, uh, but there has to be some guidance because experience has shown us from the historic side of things that ashes which are uncollected and are allowed to remain in that state uh, that actually measures, uh, if I was to put a number on it, it would run into thousands mm -hmm. of historic. Uh, and it's not right that these ashes should be kept up in, in storerooms, etc., around the country in funeral directors or indeed in, in attics and crematoriums, for instance. So the legislation is very much geared for moving forward. And it's worth saying that the opportunity is also taken and is ongoing to address the historic ones because we feel there has to be something put in place there as well, some arrangement, uh, but from a practical side, somebody has to deal with it and somebody has to, there will be costs in, involved if it's going back to a crematorium, for instance, to where a person was cremated, uh, somebody has to spend time to then do something with the ashes. Not all crematoriums scatter, some of them will only enter. Uh, so there's all of these issues as well. They don't all do the same. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Minister, you uh, indicated the intention was that the regulations would come into force on the 4th of April. Yes. Uh, when do you anticipate the Code of Practice being uh, published? So um, we would start working with uh, crematoria uh, once these regulations are in place, and that would be the basis, or that's the legal basis. So then we'd want to work with the um, um, industry in, in, in that Code of Practice. But as um, Mr Swanson said, there is already a code of practice in, in place. So this is about putting, um, updating that and putting it on a legal legal basis. So there's no gap. In there's no gap. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's uh, very helpful. We will now move to agenda item three, which is uh, the formal debate on the affirmative instrument on which we have just taken evidence. Can I remind uh, all present uh, that uh, it is now for the minister to move the debate, which, uh, to move the motion, which I shall invite him to do in a moment. The officials will no longer uh, participate, uh, and members who wish to participate and speak in the debate should catch my eye. Minister, can I invite you to move the motion S5M15440? Formally moved. Thank you very much. Does any member wish to participate in the debate? Uh, if not, uh, I well, I, of course, the minister may wish to sum up, but there is uh, we've, covered, we've, the we've covered all the territory. Uh, so the question is now that the motion S5M15440 be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are agreed. Thank you very much, and thank the minister and the officials for their time. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to agenda item number four. Uh, which is also subordinate le legislation, consideration of a negative instrument, the burial and cremation pregnancy loss prescribed information and forms Scotland regulations 2018. Uh, that's SSI 2018 384. There has been no motion to annul, and the delegated Persian Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Do any members have comments which they wish to make at this juncture? If not, uh, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations in relation to this instrument? <coughs> that is agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move into private session. <laughs>